you're surfing a wave. Half the battle is making sure you're in the water when the wave comes, right? That is really important because like if you see the wave coming, you're still on the beach. There's there's no way that you're going to get out there in time to be able to surf it. I think that goes into the importance of timing. The other thing is no surfer really can make waves. You don't have the power to change the actual tide. And so I think that great founders are incredible at putting themselves in the position to surf waves, but I don't think anybody can make waves themselves. You can just surf them. Chris, I am so excited for this. I love the frameworks that you wrote. I heard so many great things from Josh, from Jared, from many others. So thank you so much for joining me today, Chris. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, we're going to have a great discussion today. I always love a little bit of background, a little bit of context setting. So how did you make your way into the world of venture first? And let's start there. Yeah, uh, I wish I could say it was uh, in- intentional and not accidental, but it was more accidental. Um, truth be told, I didn't even know that venture capital was a thing when I was uh, growing up or in college. Um I actually maybe thought it was, I, I probably as a kind of bleeding heart liberal college student lumped it in and maligned it with all the finance of like, oh, these, like this isn't that actually interesting. Um, it wasn't until I graduated, um, I graduated, I didn't have a job. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I stumbled basically backwards into like the tech meetup scene in New York. I remember going to a meetup at Shake Shack back when there was just one Shake Shack and it's like a couple dozen people. It's this meetup called Hackers and Founders. <clears throat> and I just became enamored by the idea of uh, a tech ecosystem in uh, in the non... It, that's not Silicon Valley. I, I grew up in Burlingame uh, which is like halfway in between San Francisco and Palo Alto on the peninsula. Yeah, you've got so Alana's the, there. It's one of, of my favorite brunch spots. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an amazing, amazing place to grow up. I feel like the the cops in Burlingame have pretty easy jobs. Um, for yeah. me, for better or for worse, I'm a hipster with all like the insufferable qualities associated with it. And the idea of a tech plate, like a tech epicenter that wasn't two on the nose was really interesting. And I think in retrospect, in hindsight, I just got very lucky that rising tide lifts all boats and, you know, New York and other cities, um, anywhere that wasn't Silicon Valley also benefited greatly from globalization and internet and Zoom and internet, you know, digital communication. Um, but to answer your question succinctly, um, I knew Josh Kushner from college. Um, we were classmates. He was a year above me. And uh, uh, there, you know, as I was getting my feet wet in the trying to figure out what was up from down in tech, I was reaching out to all my friends who were in, in tech, tech adjacent. And they're like, hey, have you caught up with Josh recently? He's, um, he's like starting a venture capital firm and an angel investing no so he and i caught up and i obviously had lo- very low switching cost at the time not doing anything and i asked him if he wanted help and um, and very graciously started working together and that was my introduction to venture i, I thrive capital at the time it was a 10 million dollar fund um i'd like to think that i got a startup experience but it just happened to be a venture capital firm um, because we really went from zero to, you know, you name it, uh, in a bit, very rich, very short period of time. Can I ask you? You guys really scaled the firm so incredibly. Um, why did you decide to leave Thrive to found Pace? What was that catalyst moment? Yeah, uh, I would say it's a confluence of a, a, a handful of things. First, I mean, Thrive. Rightfully so is going to be Josh's life's work. I, I think he, it's amazing to see what he has built with it. And I somewhat selfishly was interested in, you know, what, 
what is going to be my, you know, hopefully my and other people's professional life's work. And so I think that was a, a, a large input. Um, there are other smaller inputs, like I really like early stage investing. And as we grew in fund size at Thrive, it felt like I wasn't sure if I could write the kind of size checks that would make sense for those larger fund sizes. Mostly, I think it, I was curious, I was interested in understanding what would be my long-term professional life's work. Okay, so we understand that this is a professional life's work. We want to take lessons from that incredible experience with Thrive to this new endeavor being Pace. What do you think are one or two things that you really took from your experience building and scaling Thrive with Josh and Co that really impacted how you build Pace? Yeah, um, I think the one of the things that Thrive does really, really, really well, um, in my opinion, maybe even better than anyone else in the industry, is it leans into people's potential, uh, regardless of their age, regardless of their credentials. Um, you know, when I reflect on the kind of responsibility that I was able to have at Thrive with with no justification, um, I you know the first board I ever sat on was Twitch. I was twenty five or twenty six. I had no business doing that, uh, sort of like tr from a traditional sense. And I think in an industry where firms, a lot of venture capital firms, understandably compensate on the basis of like performance rather than potential and uh you know people junior investor you know junior investors in venture are kind of constantly struggling and fighting for the ability to lead deals and spread their wings and you know try their hand at investing i think one of the things that we did really well at thrive uh and mostly josh is identify people who are young, hungry, and ambitious, and just like really lean into them and not, not need to rely on a sort of check the box casting call situation where this person has XYZ credentials. How do you do that with reliability? I do the same, but bluntly, often I miss. They're not as good as I thought. They're not as smart as I thought. They're not as ambitious as I thought. You've done it with reliability. How have you been able to pick those people reliably? My short answer is, honestly, it was mostly Josh uh, at Thrive. And so I would defer all of like that special sauce to him. I think if I were to try to distill it down a little bit, it's evaluating people from a first principles approach of how high quality is their thought do they have all of the raw frameworks um, or raw materials to build frameworks of think uh, of, of thought and, and how to think um, and not over index on pedigree um, just because somebody went to X, Y, and Z or said A, B, and C or did, you know, whatever doesn't mean that they doesn't really have an indication of where they're going to go. And then also like you you're not going to get everything right. It, 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 it's, it's, you're not going to get it right every single time. And so accepting that, you know, I, I, I feel like in startups, right, like senior hires at best is a coin toss of whether or not it works out. And that's okay. Um, fortunately, we live in a world of survivor bias. So like <laughs> things that work out, work out and things that don't work out, nobody remembers. I mean, I, the thing I love with venture is you can get 99 wrong, and if there's only one right and it's right enough, then we're all in good shape. So I, I totally yes. agree with you that. Listen, I want to talk about Pace, yeah. uh, and I want to start just setting the foundations. Why did you choose the name Pace? Pace, aside from the fact that it was available, um, there were a handful of things that really resonated about the word. I would say that two, two, two distinct things. One is Pace is not... Um, necessarily a fetishization of speed. Uh, it is a, a very intentional rate of resource expenditure 
to achieve a distinct goal, right? You have to plan. It's like, okay, what is, where are we trying to go? What do we have at hand? How do we get there? Um, so it's more about the intentionality behind it rather than just like raw speed. Sometimes you have to go slow to go fast and vice versa. The other thing that we really liked about it is if you ever watch a like a com competitive race, Tour de France, Marathon, you'll have the people that are winning the race right out in front. Um, and if the camera zooms out at all, there's either like, you know, in the Tour de France, you have like the pace car or there's a runner right next to the, the lead person that's the pace setter. And those people are really, really, really important to helping keep the people running the race in the right mindset. But those people are not running the race. They're strictly on the sidelines. Their job is to make sure that when the environment changes, when things happen, spur of the moment, that the people that are competing are staying focused and keeping their heads in the game. And we think that that in many ways is the role of, like ought to be the role of venture investor where yes, we're not running the race. The founders are running the race and, but what we can do is help them stay focused even when, you know, shit hits the fan. I love that in terms of the pacemaker and you're absolutely right in terms of that analogy. The most important thing is the partnership behind any fund. Uh, you chose an equal partnership, which is a very deliberate decision. Why did you choose an equal partnership and why was that the right decision for you? Sure. Um, I'll say a few things. One, I, I think I read eBoys pretty early on in my career. This eBoys is like the edutainment chronicling of the foundation, the founding of Benchmark. And I think that was the first time that the concept of an equal partnership, like wormed its way into my brain. So I, I think I had a, like an academic appreciation for it. <clears throat> and then I got married and that was the first time that I've ever been like legally equal to somebody. And it's awesome. It's amazing. It's so great. It's so incredible. Everything from, yes, like non-zero sum framework. Um, but the construct, both in practice and philosophically, it resonated just so much with me in practice that I felt like I don't think it's too selfish or too high of a bar to want this in a professional context, the same way that I have in a personal context. And so, um, pace is an equal partnership for, I would say two primary reasons. One is, you know, I'm sure you've heard the line, show me the incentives. I'll show you the outcome. <clears throat> sure. How do you get people, how do you incentivize people to do their best work? How do you get people to act like owners? This phrase, like you act like an owner is so important in, in making people kind of exhibiting the right behavior. Uh, what better way to actually make people feel like owners than actually make them owners and, and, and make them equal. There's a lot of space. I, I mean, like the distance between a 51 49 split is way more than 2%. Like <laughs> it might as well be like 80%. We think a lot about designing the system and designing the incentives that encourage and elicit the, the, the desired behavior. The other thing that I think is really interesting about the equal partnership model is it's really attractive uh, from a recruiting and retain, uh, recruiting and retaining great talent. Huh. So in a world where the vast majority of firms are hierarchically structured and you know we talk, going back to firms be compensating on the basis of performance, not potential and really long feedback loops where, you know, if you have an Olympic athlete and the day before they win gold, they know they're great. They know they're phenomenal. They are fully confident they can win gold. And then the day after they win gold, all of a sudden the entire world's like, oh my God, you're so great. I, I think in a world where the feedback loops are similarly super, super, super long. There are a lot of people out there that know they're great, that know they're gold medalists, but maybe aren't seen by the by where they are at or the rest of the world as gold medalists. And 
we think that an equal partnership structure is really, really, really attractive uh, and a great weapon in recruiting those those kinds of people, um, particularly before they're acknowledged as gold medalists. And then from a retention perspective, I don't think there's a there's a construct out there that is uh, better suited to retain properly retain and incentivize great talent. I mean, well done on getting the marriage quote in that. You, you've got brownie points forever from your wife now for that one. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I do want to ask, you also chose a very deliberate decision not to have portfolio-added support, which in this world of venture value add and services, again, goes against the grain quite in a way. Uh, why did you decide not to have the portfolio-added support services model of venture? Why was that? So I think it can best be summed up uh, maybe with a, a line of like, you can't pay someone else to go to your kid's soccer games for you. <laughs> and like, and maybe that's too, like, that's too paternalistic of a view. But when we, when a, when a founder chooses to work with us and we kind of shake hands, the implicit social contract, the, 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 the implicit contract is that we show up, like they are the person that they're talking to, that they want to join their board is the person that is going to be spending time with them. That means we're not just like tagging somebody in and sending, you know, hey, like we, we sign up to, to help this company out. And then all of a sudden they're interfacing with somebody that they've never met before. I forget who said it, but um, Aurora's first suggested, but there's this sort of like litmus test, which is in a venture capital firm, there are things that are meant to scale the GP, like the investor. And those are sort of questionable um, because really they're not necessarily uh, directly helping the companies. They're helping the investor primarily, not really helping the companies. We think that venture isn't an asset that is meant to scale. It's uh, pretty hands-on. You roll up your sleeves. You you know, you choose a handful of relationships and companies and um, uh, we believe in a fewer, deeper relationship approach. And on the back of that, I, I think it makes more sense for us to fully commit to every company that we invest in rather than try to build out an apparatus that makes it easier for us to, you know, deploy more capital. Well, you, you say fewer, deeper there. It really correlates to the type of model that you go for in terms of portfolio construction. So I do just want to dig in on that before we move into frameworks, which is just how big's the fund and how do you think about average check size, ownership requirement, number of companies in a portfolio, just to give us a perspective on that. Yep, yep. Um, so we're, we're, we just started investing out of our second fund. Um, fund one was 150, fund two is 250. You know, portfolio construction, we believe in more of a concentrated approach. You want, you know, high teens, low twenties companies in the in a, in a portfolio for a more concentrated model. And in order for that to work, you need to own a lot of the companies that you invest in. Um, we target twenty percent ownership when we invest in a company. Uh, obviously, like, that's you Chris, don't. Chris, do you do get that? that? You, I mean, you, do you get that? Because I, I target Mila Kunis as my girlfriend and I'm still single. Okay. <laughs> so, like, my question is when do you get 20%? Like, honestly, I never see that. I would say we, we've been successful at hitting our ownership target in 70% of the companies we invested in. Rubrics are meant to kind of be broken. Um, it's funny, in venture, I feel like everyone says, Oh, like my best performing companies I own the least of, or my best performing companies I paid the highest price for. Um, yes. And if you have a really high bar of conviction, necessarily the highest conviction things that you get comfort with are the ones that you break the most number of rules on. So the ones that you pay the highest price for, you own the least of. But that doesn't mean they're inputs into it, right? It's not like, okay, well, if you pay a really high price for a company, like high price companies are good or low ownership is good. Um, it's really like you shoot for the stars and even if you miss, you know, you land on the moon. Um, I don't think anybody will exceed anything in their like heist expectations. And so that is our con that, that that's our framework of approach. You establish your rules to know what your exceptions are. Um, but 
we it's it's not just kind of lip service. We actually do really focus on it. My question to you is: You said that say let's say we go for twenty companies. You have ten each between you and Jordan. That is a lot of companies now. You're on fun too to be managing and on top of if you're in the low like high touch game without any services. Yes, is that truly scalable? You think about it. If you add another twenty companies, you'll soon be at twenty each with board seats. Like, is that scalable? Yeah. Um. So I think. The short answer is yes. The longer answer is, you know, Jordan and I don't view ourselves as the only investors at Pace. Um, we have ambitions of growing the firm considerably. Um, I would love nothing more than my last day at Pace to be, you know, Pace's best day ever. And so I think the one of the answers is we would love, like, we're interested in in more GPs being yeah. at the firm. Uh, more equal GPs being at the firm, right? So, like, it's not, you know, Jordan and I have kind of issued terms like co-founder because we think that that actually kind of robs future partners of the firm from agency and ownership. So we're an equal partnership. We want to grow the firm. That's one solve for the bandwidth thing. The other solve for the bandwidth thing that isn't that common across the industry is we take our time. You know, the the investment period for fund one was three and a half years. I know funds, I know firms that have raised funds and deployed them and that raised another fund in the same calendar year. And so I think we're happy to take our time and be patient and wait for our shots and swing when we want, you know, be patient for, for the right pitch. And that helps alleviate that bandwidth issue because companies become successful, they get acquired, you know, your bandwidth constraints roll off or the companies go under. I have to agree with you. Oh, we're a three-year deployment period and I'm just looking at every deal we didn't do last year because of price and go, thank God. I am so grateful to have not done deals for the first time in my career. Um, I do want to discuss the companies themselves because you wrote a brilliant tweet recently and it was completely the opposite of the way I think. So I ask every company that I meet, Chris, I'm giving you a billboard in Times Square. My friend, what are you going to put on it in 10 sentences or less? Captivate the audience. And you tweeted, invest in companies that cannot be described in a single sentence. <laughs> so very different ideas. Why am I wrong? Why do you believe invest in companies that can't be described in a single sentence? So let me first say it. I could be wrong like that. That could definitely be the wrong advice. Um, and that's probably on the spectrum of like more catnippy tweets <laughs> that I've ever put out or like fire brandy tweets I ever put out. But I think there's a big difference between consumer marketing and describing the actual essence of what a company is doing, right? Mm -hmm. So consumer marketing 100% requires a very pithy, concise description. When you want to uh, engender word of mouth or in a sales pitch or an elevator pitch, you have to be able to develop a very succinct description with hooks about the core or at least one of the core value propositions of what the company does and what it builds. But in totality, if Everything that a company is doing and building can really be accurately described in a single sentence. It's probably too one-dimensional. Um, it's probably not ambitious enough. It probably isn't doing enough. I think the other thing that I really take issue with is venture has zooming out. Um, I had a blog when I first started in venture, um, probably still out there. Um, but when I first started working in venture, I wrote, I wrote, started a blog, I wrote a bunch of posts, and then I stopped blogging because I thought to myself, who am I to blog? This is insane. Like, I don't have anything actually worth contributing. And, and even worse, I'm paranoid at the idea that I could put something out there and it would influence somebody to make the wrong decision. So I, I, I very much ascribe to the kind of Hippocratic oath, first, do no harm. 
Uh, and I think a lot of investors can do a lot of harm. One of the things that I take issue with in the venture world is I think a lot of people put a lot of thoughts out there taken as gospel. And there's this kind of fetishization of, you know, distill down what you're building, make it punchy. You know, your, your slide deck should be 12, you know, your pitch deck should be 12 slides. And I think that makes it easier for us as investors to process a lot of information when we're like, Hey, entrepreneurs, you should put your business in a box. And so we can check them all off. But I think that also leads people, I fear that that leads people to over rotate and in the idea generation phase, create things that are too simplistic. Um, something is, you know, I'm, I'm sure you remember anytime a company is successful, it spawns a countless number of X for Y's where it's sure. like, okay, Uber is really successful. So I'm going to start Uber for, I need to think of an example that Baby doesn't like sisters, crochet that exists washes, in company. Fishing instructors, right, exactly. piano teachers. <laughs> and I think one of the challenges is um, <clears throat> it's easy to describe successful companies when all is said and done in a single sentence. That is clear. Because they have established the category and developed the vernacular to be able to describe what it is that they did that was so hard for them to describe in the beginning, right? Airbnb, it's, it's e Airbnb is easy to describe in a single sentence retroactively, okay, right? Like they, they pioneer the sharing economy. Um, <clears throat> but if you were to describe Airbnb, in the beginning and tried to explain how it affects real estate prices in markets because it changes the calculus of economic return on home ownership. Like that would be impossible to describe in a single sentence. And I fear that the kind of focus on, you know, pithiness dampens the imaginative scope of founders. I, I totally get that, especially when you say there are about how category creation and dominance leads to consumer understanding, where, as you said, Airbnb, everyone knows now, sharing, okay, I'm going to kind of borrow from someone else and pay a toll for that usage. I totally get you there, and I think that's super interesting. It makes me think of something that your partner said. Your partner, Jordan, said, you're world-class when it comes to isolating companies and businesses down to their core atomic value swaps. Now, this sounds incredibly intelligent. What does he mean by this? Uh, it, pro it probably sounds more heady than it actually is. It's, it's really like the essential value exchange between a company or product and counterparty, the uh, other, whoever is on the other side. So, for example, let's say you, you walk into a convenience store and you buy a candy bar, right. buy a candy bar for a dollar. That atomic value swap is you are exchanging a dollar in for a candy bar, which is presumably giving you one dollar or more of value. And that's a sustainable swap. That's an ex a sustainable value exchange. And so when you apply that to interactions at a company or product level, that's what I'm, that, that's what the, the concept of an atomic value swap is. It's like, how do you describe what is being offered, the perception of value of what is being offered, and then how fairly compensated the party is that's offering the value for the value that's being delivered. <clears throat> um, let me think of a, a good example. So, um, one of the challenges with, um, one of the challenges that has like historically plagued online dating, for example, is uh, how do you appropriately price helping somebody find their life's partner? Like, there's there's virtually no amount of compensation. Like if, if you actually find your life partner on a online platform, there's no way that that platform is being appropriately compensated for the value that is delivered to you. That's crazy. On the, on the flip side of that, 
there are a lot of marketplaces that perfectly price the value that they deliver. So most marketplaces actually perfectly price the value that they deliver. Let's, let's actually just dig in on that. So they perfectly price it. Okay, Instacart for you versus for a low-income worker, respectfully. Uh, the price and value ratio are actually misaligned. The time that you save in store is 30 minutes. To you, that could be $1,000, that value capture retrieval. To the low-income worker, it's probably $6. So actually, there isn't a perfection of pricing because the value is subjective to consumer, no? Um, so Instacart isn't a marketplace. Um, I don't think, I don't think Instacart is like as defined as marketplaces have like fungible supply and, or fungible demand and then like commoditized supply. Um, so it's, it's a little different. I understand what you're trying to say. Um, bring it back to like the, I, I will say like the genius behind Instacart and DoorDash and other companies like that is that they perfectly price discriminate laziness and the value of like a leisure hour. Generally speaking, um, people are a little bit more price sensitive when it comes to, um, utilitarian things. You know, if you're if you're buying two apples and one apple is $1.50 and one apple is 25 cents and you, you think they're the same, you're probably, you're going to buy the 25 cent apple. But if, uh, you know, what's the value of time? Like I can, I can assign any amount of, you know, any dollar value to time or making memories or, um, and so I would say DoorDash is really, DoorDash and Discard are really good at price discriminating uh, people's leisure hours and how they choose to spend it because um laziness is this insidiously self-justifiable thing where it's like okay well it's really prices because i'm saving myself time um, I, I, but going I back just, to sorry going back to the idea of the atomic value swap maybe i can think of a, a, a better example that isolates what like what it is um Let's take Twitter. What is Twitter's atomic value swap for a user? Twitter's promise to a user is distribution. You show up to Twitter with ideas, content. You contribute your content to Twitter. And in exchange, Twitter offers you a meritocratic environment that can reward your contributions with engagement and distribution. It doesn't offer you anything else. Notably, it doesn't offer you any economic reward for your contribution. It just promises to compensate you in distribution of your thought. That's different from a platform like YouTube. YouTube actually compensates you economically with or, or for the content you contribute to it. So those are two different value propositions. Um, the other thing is you, you, you can you can view that very diametrically opposite to something like a Substack, where Substack very explicitly people are creating content with the idea of monetizing it, not necessarily just for distribution. Um, most social networks, or the one the most companies that we understand as social networks do that. They incentivize the incremental contribution of content with the promise of distribution with no, no expectation of economic return in exchange. And as a result, they incentivize and attract the incremental marginal content creator because as the network grows, the prospect of attaining distribution within that network increases. On a consumption side, you know, the consumption atomic value swap is easier to isolate. It's like, I I want to be entertained. I want, you know, I'm willing to spend this iota of time in exchange for this unit of entertainment or knowledge or whatever. Um, I would say like lean back and lean forward consumptions are slightly different. Um, but in general, you know, I've had many people on who talk about us moving away from the social graph and moving towards content discovery engines. Social graphs, actually, we were wrong. 
they don't signal what we want to see in terms of content and algorithms do a much better job do you agree that we've left the era of social graphs and actually they don't hold value and that we have moved to content discovery engines and ml recommendations for content probably i think about it a lot through the lens of how do you solve the merchandising problem with infinitely long tails of supply and demand and you can approach it with these like rough heuristic cuts that are chunkier and the social graph is the social graph works and worked because of the idea that who people select for in their social graph is a proxy for their interest. And so in some ways, you're using somebody's social graph as spark notes for the integral, the, the, the fully like, you know, minute integral of all of their interests. And that's, that's a cut at it. But if you were to like zoom in at a minute level, it's probably not capturing the full fidelity of that person's interests. And so it was at one point good, uh, but when there is something that gives us a higher fidelity view of the kind of primary information, then becomes no longer as relevant. Uh, you mentioned laziness earlier. I, I loved something in the frameworks, which I always think back to when I'm investing in consumers today. Uh, and it's the seven deadly sins. You said the seven deadly sins are actually the seven core motivators. What are the seven deadly sins just to get a framework? And how do they apply to the world of consumer for anyone thinking that we've taken a very dodgy religious turn? <laughs> sure. Um, the seven deadly sins, I mean, this isn't new. It's been, uh, I feel like it's on an original thought and a lot of people have, have like much smarter than me have also said it. Um, seven deadly sins are pride, envy, lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, and I always forget the seventh one, um, wrath. Interestingly enough, these have not changed over millennia, right? <laughs> these have withstood the test of time. So we're talking about survivor bias, the seven deadly sins proven, Darwinistically proven. And the reason why I call them the seven core motivator, I actually think maybe the seven deadly sins have been, been poorly branded. <laughs> um, I actually think the seven deadly sins are really core motivators. They describe why people do things. And I would go far as far to say, like, honestly, they're the only reasons why people do things. I think it's possible to distill down any individual behavior that anyone takes and bucket it into one or more of these seven deadly sins. Even like, you know, people say, hey, but like, what about like nonprofit work or altruism or, you know, some of these more virtuous things? I kind of subscribe to the Kantian school of thought that altruism or, you know, when we do things that are perceived as virtuous by society, in many ways, it's things to serve our own ego. It's things to fuel our own sense of pride and create a form of ourselves that we think more favorably about. And so uh, it's really, you know, I think another way you can describe it perhaps less third raily is the seven deadly sins are ways to describe self-motivation. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I think most people, all people are inherently self-motivated. So when we think about that and we think about the ways to motivate people, how does that fit into your thesis around consumer investing? What you like to see, what drives consumer behavior? And what you look for in an enticing consumer investment? Just what's the tie back to investing? This is like probably contentious. Um, but one of my frameworks is I think that the like virtuousness of a company is inversely related to its enterprise value. So let me first say that we have to all agree that we are investing within this framework of capitalism, right? Of like enter capturable enterprise value and shareholders. And, you know, when we think about enterprise value creation, I think it's easy to be susceptible to like these 
things that appeal to our own sense of ego of like doing good in the world. Um, but the problem is there are these things called nonprofits that are designed not to create enterprise value that do incredible work, incredible work. And there is a part within capitalism as construct for great work to be done by actors inside of it. And so I would argue that nonprofits are maybe the perfect example of that inverse correlation between enterprise value or capturable enterprise value and virtue created and done by an organization. And so a litmus test or framework that I have is, you know, the more that a company leans on or touts or suggests that it is doing good in the world, um, virtuousness in the world, that's great marketing. But when the rubber hits the road and like translates into enterprise value creation, not as advantaged. Sorry, how man Sam, why? Because the opportunity cost of that, like virtue value creation, then the trash from the enterprise value creation. Like, do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm just thinking back to yeah. like blending off, like, hey, you can do good and make a lot of money in the same vein. And so I'm just trying to compare this. Yes. So I, I think you, so what is this not saying? I'm not saying that companies that are successful can't do good. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying that um, there is this inverse relationship that particularly under capitalism where, let, let me take a step back. <clears throat> I think one of the one of the things that I wanted to define is I think society perceives virtue as when somebody is not acting economically, right? Like if I were to, for example, give away money, <clears throat> giving away money, that's something that is not economically rational. No person like homo economicus would not give away money, but society would view that as virtuous and would say like, oh, what a good person. Um, so if you kind of describe virtue as an individual or a company acting kind of not rationally economically or not doing something that homo economicus would do, then like you, it, it's the logical conclusion is that there, that behavior does not lead to structurally better enterprise value creation. Um, it can be effective in marketing. It can be effective in recruiting, but at like a, from a core business model perspective, or you distill down the atomic value swap of a company, there isn't a ton of room. There is perhaps no room to internalize virtue into that core atomic value swap as a company. So when we think about this atomic value swap and we kind of apply it to those kind of seven deadly sins or seven core motivators and just to retrofit it to the real world so we get it, you obviously worked on Twitch at, at Thrive. It was one of your great investments. Uh, well, I, I want to understand, how would you bucket that in terms of where it sits in the seven deadly sins or seven great motivators? And how would you retrofit Twitch to that model? Sure. Um, I would say Twitch, Twitch is in the bucket of a lot of other user-generated content networks where on the consumption side, it's entertainment, right? There, It's like some form of sloth and envy and pride. Um, on the content creation side, it's some form of pride and greed. And I don't think that like describing it that way is actually bad. I think that Again, I think the seven deadly sins suffer from a branding problem. Um, but like most user-generated content networks, uh, it is incentivizing content creation by offering distribution and also economic return because Twitch, like YouTube, pays their content creators. And on the consumption side, it's just competing the same way that YouTube and Twitch, um, YouTube and Twitter and TikTok and Instagram Snapchat all compete for entertainment. Totally get you. Can I ask you, you said before about new content kind of uh, UGC platforms, the new content UGC and like UGC platforms essentially uh, 
enfranchise or encourage a previously disenfranchised creator. What did you mean by this? And how do you think about that when investing today? I'm not sure where you can find it, but uh, the founder of Musical.ly that became TikTok had this amazing talk. Um, I feel like it's like oft cited and then not discoverable online. I think the current state of the world is the Darwinistic output of really efficient, like like the Darwinistic output of the efficient market. So one of the things I ask is, what are the what are the very good reasons things are exactly the way that they are? Because everyone, every single actor is constantly trying to extract maximum value from the existing set of like how things are. And so if you are trying to create structurally new value, one, I think the best way and is proven in the success of user and content networks is to, you have to, you have to empower a previously disenfranchised set of creators. So people that were structurally disadvantaged. Let's look at um, TikTok. If you look at the most popular content creator on TikTok, um, I think it may not be no, may no longer be the case, but definitely was for a very long time. Charlie D'Amelio. Charlie D'Amelio is a uh, she made her, a name for herself creating dance content, and dance as a as a form of media was structurally challenged in Instagram and Snapchat because audio music, which is so core to the content consumption experience, was never an endemic part of either of those platforms. And so when you look at TikTok, when you look at Musical.ly, audio is structurally a part of the atomic forms of content. And when you include music, all of a sudden dance is elevated from this thing that like maybe, maybe you enjoyed, but then like you had to opt in to turn the sound on and like this it is elevated from being this kind of second class citizen on Instagram that like that like you know rewards aesthetics or Snapchat, which like doesn't really have has built up distribution mechanisms, to being a first class citizen of content on a platform like Musically. And so, you know, thing you know, phrases like jokes like, oh, I'm sure you have a face for radio, uh, it kind of suggests that. Maybe people that aren't, you know, good looking enough to be successful on TV because of the challenges of like what we reward as society can be enfranchised in a format that actually doesn't need them to be good looking. Chris, is that a subtle suggestion that I'm doing the right medium? If so, uh, I, I appreciate it, and you and my mother are thoroughly aligned. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, no, I, I, I totally agree with you there in terms of the uh, encouragement or inspiration to a previously disenfranchised group. I think there's another important factor, which is the market timing itself, though, and being right on market timing. How do you feel about the importance of why now? A lot of people are like, well, great founders, they can, they can kind of win it into existence. How do you feel about why now? I think the best analogy I can come up with for success in startups and great founders is you're surfing a wave. And half the battle is making sure you're in the water when the wave comes, right? That is really important because like if you see the wave coming, you're still on the beach. There's, there's no way that you're going to get out there in time to be able to surf it. And so I think that goes into the importance of timing. But at, the other thing is no surfer really can make waves. You don't have the power to change the actual tide. And so I think that great founders are incredible at putting themselves in the position to surf waves and then also are able to navigate and surf waves very, very, very well. They're great at recruiting. They're great at this money that read it you know managing but i don't think anybody can make waves themselves you can just surf them and you can maybe you're really good at identifying them 
Chris, can I ask you, I used to be in the camp of it's all about the founder. It's all about the founder. Now, honestly, I, I'm not at all. I'm actually, I would much rather a really, really great market. Um, and I take a much more market centric approach because I've seen how difficult it can be when you're great in a shit market. How do you feel about market versus founder centrality, honestly? I, I think I probably tend to agree with you. I, I, I tend to agree with that sentiment more. And I'll, I'll sort of, uh, there are a couple adages. One is, I feel like it's Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett has this line of, I like investing in businesses that can be run by a ham sandwich, um, which <laughs> suggests the durability of businesses themselves. If businesses get up and running. Uh, if businesses are at scale, like there's a lot of momentum and inertia in in companies. And particularly if they have moats and they're taking advantage of moats, sometimes companies can just be successful, period. And it doesn't even matter. like who's running them. Um, the other thing, the other kind of cut of it that may be elucidating is if you have like the world's greatest founder and you put them in a market that doesn't have any demand, right? Where it's like, okay, I, you know, I don't know what's some like, you know, you, you ask the world's greatest founder to like make Tra travel in COVID. There we go. Travel in a uh, pandemic. <laughs> Sure, something that's like impossible, structurally impossible. It doesn't matter how good they are. They're just not going to be able to create something that the entirety of capitalism, the entirety of like the Darwinistic state of the current economy is structurally against. It's just like that's too heavy of a lift. Conversely, you can have markets, you know, we're going back to the wave analogy. You could just be like accidentally in an area and then you get taken because it's that powerful um you reflect on the dot-com boom or you know there are plenty of people who created a lot of value whether or not it's enduring it, it, there's maybe a debate about whether or not you know certain certain value creation is enduring but like definitely created a lot of value and it was almost certainly beta you know, I, I think there's like this, w one of the questions I like to ask people is like, would you rather invest in an A plus business with a, you know, B plus operating team or a B plus business and an A plus operating team? And I think people's answer to that will often indicate their stage preference. Honestly, I think most people who invest really, 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 really early might skew to the team answer. And then people that are a little bit later will probably will probably favor the business. And then people that answer really, really, really later, um, where businesses come like you know, companies are competing in like very crowded markets, may rotate back to the team answer. But like I tend to agree. I think that markets are significantly more, in, uh, markets are a huge, huge, huge input into outcomes, particularly in venture. Can I ask you, we mentioned there about being in the sea or being in the ocean for that wave coming. There's still an element of timing. You've got to have your board ready. You've got to be ready to jump on it. How do you think about market timing risk? Many people said that you see very ahead of the curve into the future. By doing so, you're taking a lot of market timing risk. Transparently, Chris, I don't like market timing risk. I want a product where if we put it in market, I know we got demand. So how do you feel about market timing risk? I agree. I think timing, like being too early is just as bad as being too late. In many ways, it's kind of like rock, paper, scissors, where you kind of have to be just one step ahead. If you're multiple steps ahead, you lose. Um, if you go out to surf at midnight, you're toast, right? <laughs> so I completely agree that market timing is really important. Um, but you take that risk much more than me. You see ahead of the I curve. And you take it much more than I will do. So how do you think about your relationship to market timing? Because you do take yeah. it. So it worked. if we're using the surfing analogy, I think it's possible to zoom into like 
if you go out at 5 a.m. instead of 6 a.m., like maybe you're taking incremental market timing risk, but that's it. We're, we're talking about it's still in the realm of timing the market properly, uh-huh. not completely disregarding some of the factors that you don't have control over. It's not being hubristic and saying, okay, I can go out at 9 or 10 p.m. and like, I'm going to make these waves and like, I'm going to surf them. Um, I also recognize I'm taking the surfing analogy way farther considering that like I've never surfed and so maybe everything that I'm saying is completely wrong. <laughs> this is not the billabong. Thank you for listening. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I would say the closer you are to the change, truly, the less it feels like market timing risk. Because I would describe waves as the process of a truth going from a truth being spread from very, very very small consensus to global consensus. So what do I mean by that? Um, Let's take, um, I don't know, what what are some macro trends? Mobile, cloud computing, maybe AI. The vast majority of the world woke up to AI in what November when ChatGPT was released. So many smart people have been working on AI for years prior to that. And so like one could have argued that like there's like market timing risk if you were in AI in October of last year. Um, But the vast majority of people that have been spending time in this space understand that that is just not the case. That just, it hasn't been, it hasn't become consensus yet, but it is inevitable that it will be. You said something before, uh, any company that is pure execution risk without any market risk is not a suitable venture investment. Now I saw this and I thought, no, that's so wrong. I tweeted it because I thought it sounded smart. But like, if you look at Tesla, yeah, which is like, you know, greener like, movement, greener transport in nicer car at affordable-ish cost, there's no market risk there. There's no, if you produce a car like this, there will be sufficient demand. There's only execution risk on ability to build, ability to produce at scale within cost and budgets. So it, help me understand this one any company needs that market risk to be a suitable venture investment. Well, first, I would contest the idea that Tesla had no market risk. Um, How, I, uh, t- tell me, I'm happy to be wrong. How? Sure. So I think there are many different ways to look at Tesla. I think, um, well, let's, let's kind of, you, you'd like take different cuts of it. <clears throat> what if Teslas were a million dollars each? Would it be as successful as it is today? Of course not. No, time is you know, a tenth. What if Tesla's had ten mile radius, like a battery only had ten miles of of a range? Sure, but our but our hypothesis is if we can provide a car that is sustainable, green energy, and is sufficient for the majority of the population at an affordable price, then there will be sufficient demand, and there is no market risk. I think that's um that's huge market risk, right? It's like that's not proven it's certainly if you were to walk into the office of any like big auto exec like they would be like no that's crazy oil you know you have structural infrastructure gas stations every half mile you know you have all of this all of these things that advantage internal combustion cars and so electricity like people have like, all of these I I would say there's there's tremendous market risk creating Tesla. Like there wasn't um it was impossible to say that there would be millions, tens, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars of demand from consumers for electric vehicles. I, I'm really sorry, dude. I don't get you. It's good for the planet, it's cheaper than fuel, it'll look great. Uh, I would say um, there are there are pl- there are plenty of places where it's not cheaper than fuel. 
there are plenty of places where it's not cheaper than fuel. Like if you are, if you exist in a place that is off grid, it is, and, and particularly like a decade ago, two decades ago, electricity was more expensive. There are places where electricity is more expensive to deliver, especially per uh, unit of energy than fuel. Like in a post-economic first world country, yes, electricity is, and, and like we have economies of scale production, we can get something that's cheaper than fuel, but... <laughs> I'm not planning on supplying casters to Lesotho in Africa. Yeah. Okay. Of course, we're fucking pro giving them to the UK and to France and Germany and the US. Like, of course, we're I, I, that's where we're going. Yeah. I, so just I, I, I don't see how you could view Tesla as not having market risk. You're like introducing a product that doesn't have structurally validated demand and the hypothesis even like even that even the use of the word hypothesis suggests that there is market risk well i think everything has a hypothesis before you introduce its market when i when i have a jumper company i have a hypothesis that they will wear green and orange jumpers uh frequently enough that they will see the atomic value in it and buy it from me um, I don't I think know. There are... No one's transacted on it. Everything is a hypothesis until there is a concrete uh, transaction. Yes and no. Um, I would say there are there are plenty. I think in venture we're so primed to think that way. The vast majority of the world, the vast majority of the economic like transactions that happen in the world are happen in things that don't have a lot of market risk or wouldn't have market risk for, income, like for, for a new entrant. So for example, <clears throat> let's say I want to make ball bearings. There's no market risk in making ball bearings. There's entirely validated demand. That doesn't mean that there isn't money to be made in making ball bearings, particularly if I have an advantage, a cost advantage in making ball bearings cheaper or faster or better than other people but like the demand for ball bearings is and will be constant that is like that's not changing the demand is very well understood i, I have no idea what a ball bearing is but in the uk i think it might be something different to what yeah. you call it so uh <laughs> um but i i do i do get you and i yeah I, uh, yeah, we sit on different sides of the fence on this one, uh, but it's okay. It's good to have a difference of opinion, my friend. I'm learning this. A, a question for you, though, is like so many investors, so many founders get really pissed off when it's like, oh, he turned me down because of market size. They're not, they're not, you know, they don't see the size of the market. How do you think about market sizing risk? Sorry, going, just going back to like market risk versus execution risk for a sec. Yeah. <clears throat> you're wearing a polo shirt that the demand for polo shirts is well understood i could start a business also creating polo shirts that would not be suitable for venture because the chain that like there is no market risk in making a polo shirt it's incredibly well understood demand and it, especially if there is nothing structurally different about the product. That being said, there is money to be made. Like, can I start a company that like... But, 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 I, but I disagree completely because okay. it doesn't have to be structurally different about the product. It could be structurally different about the go-to-market, about the brand. It could be that this means something different to each user. It could be that we provide it in a completely different go-to-market. That These are all part of the company, not the product, which make it venture-backable. So... I think one of the challenges is the conflation of like venture backable with creating value. There are plenty of companies out there that can create value, can create a lot of value that aren't suitable as venture investments. So is Warby Parker a venture investment? Is Allbirds a venture investment? Is Hims 
these companies wear like Viagra, glasses, shoes, fantastic products, but that would fit your thesis. Your I would say the vast majority of direct consumer brands, not suitable venture investments. There are some companies like you could argue that something like a Hings was surfing a regulatory change where telemedicine was empowering a category of like cons like demand expansion. That's maybe a more acceptable rationale for a suitable venture investment. But Albert, like I don't want to pick on Allbirds, but like what's Allbirds market cap today? I think it's about 250 million. I mean, let's check it out no, now. Maybe. No, maybe I've, I've done it in real time. They've raised 200 million. And I'm, I'm, I'm wearing all the, oh shit. Uh, it's 179 million. Yeah. I mean, 179. Yeah. It, it just, I, <clears throat> I would say the vast majority, and, and that's the one successful company in maybe hundreds of companies that have tried to do the same. I'm not saying that like those companies can't create value particularly if you look at the wealthiest person in the world on the back of consumer goods, like LVMH, I am making the argument that venture capital is not the right capital instrument for the, the growth of those companies. Even if you were to look at like Blue Ribbon Sports, Nike, they're like debt, like these are great Thing. These are great capital instruments to help these companies grow, and you don't need the pressure and cost of capital associated with venture capital. To I help get you, grow. but okay. But on the flip side, I've seen this firsthand with my brother's business. Uh, you know, he runs a more traditional business that would not be venture backable in ways. And you're like debt, and I'm like debt, and he's like, yeah, but debt providers are not willing to take on risk profiles when we don't have cash flows going back five years, when there's uncertain uh, value on expansion into the U.S., when there is a level of uncertainty that you know Nike's saying, hey, we're going to expand beyond trainers to apparel. The banks go, well, you don't have five years of financials, and you're a fucking trainer company. No, we're not going to be. And so it's like the debt, the financial instruments that aren't venture capital don't suit the product. And so venture retrofits itself to that, I think. I think there's a lot. I think this is increasingly happening. <clears throat> With the glut of venture capital and dollars chasing returns, I think that venture capital perhaps intentionally, maybe unintentionally, subsidizes business building of companies that should never have been venture capital targets. I don't disagree with you, but like... Venture capital as an industry is not responsible for the zero to one of value creation everywhere. Like venture capital is not responsible for putting a sandwich shop in business in like small town XYZ. That's not like, that's not why. If, if, if you it, come if you come to London now, you'll uh, see Blank Street Coffee all over London. And my mom's like, what is that? I'm like, you know Starbucks? It's like that, but 30% cheaper. She's like, oh, that doesn't sound like a good business. I'm like, yeah, it's not. <laughs> well, I guess like, let's take the opposite. Like, where does the line stop? I don't know. I agree with you. I, I'm, this one, we're totally agreed. I don't think direct consumer has worked at all. I had the founder of ButcherBox on the show recently, and ButcherBox does 600 million in revenue, very high quality revenue, the leading brand and category in the space. If you project out to a three, four years time, they'll be at a billion enterprise value of three to four billion. That is the one that's done it, like the all time leader. To me, that really shows a space which, like, as an as an asset class, is is not a venture asset class. Did ButcherBox raise venture capital? Never. There, there's there's also something where, like, if you think about what venture can help create that would never be possible bootstrapped, it's companies that are not revenue generative in the beginning. Like there, there are plenty of companies that just actually dig a J curve where like there's some hole of development or product building 
that needs to reach some point of scale, and then it can come out the other side and create money and or develop, like be fairly compensated in value exchange for what it's putting out there. If you're in the business of like making widgets and selling widgets like ButcherBox or other companies, you have the luxury of revenue from day one. And so like you like your G that's you don't structurally have a J curve in your business building. Maybe you have a self-imposed J curve because you're leaning into growth and then you are growing unprofitably and you're, you know, you're investing in OPEX and that's going to create future scalability and then your margin profile changes in the future. But there are plenty of companies out there that have revenue from day one, don't need venture capital. Can it make them grow faster? Sure. But is it existential to their existence? No. So that so that's the line then, where it is existential to their existence. That is the line where then venture capital is the right financing model. I think. think that is almost certainly like if the company literally could not exist without venture capital, that probably is the area where venture capital is a suitable I'm like spitballing this in real time. That's probably a good criteria to suggest that it is within the realm of venture capital. Do you believe in defensibility? Everyone talks about defensibility. Investors like to see defensibility. I think it's largely bullshit from day one. I think it's built over time in process with customers, with team. Do you agree or do you think defensibility can be very present on day one? I think the recipe for defensibility can be very present on day one. What does that mean? So uh, if you were to look at the system design behind companies that ultimately developed moats at scale, it's not something that like happens magically overnight once the company is up and running. It's like embedded in the core product from day one. And so I think it's possible to evaluate a company early and see the future potential of defensibility in the form of a moat. I don't think people accidentally end up with moats and defensibility. Huh. You think they're deliberate about it? Yes. You have to, I don't think I don't think anybody oopses their way into a moat. I did. <laughs> well, I did like I do ten references before every show that we do, and we've now done two thousand shows, and now I have twenty thousand references. It's an incredible data moat on a generation of venture investors. I never intended to do it at all. I just did it to ask better questions. Did you oops your way into a moat? I don't think I don't think you did. I think you were very intentional about the way in which you approached your craft and the content you create. And that led to a structural advantage, whether it's brand or distribution. And uh, I would argue that like it was very, very intentional. I maybe like, it may be like, uh, what is the way to phrase it? It may be, nice to think about it as effortless competency but i think you're being appropriately rewarded for a ton of hard work thank you i appreciate that chris we, we've gone off schedule but i've loved this are there other elements where you're like that's just it's just wrong the way we do it in venture it could be the type of companies we fund it could be our theory around defensibility it could be the importance of whatever we do are there other elements where you're like oh, it's so wrong that way Huh. One of the things that I've like thought a lot about and like the reason why I kind of am trying to create some theoretical approach to businesses with the frameworks document is I think that venture writ large encourages any and all forms of entrepreneurship, right? It's the dominant strategy to be good, like to be best for venture capital. Venture capital as an industry benefits when the most number of people are trying the most number of things because as a business venture kind of picks the winners and invests in them and so the more number of shots on goal the better 
But I also believe that there are just some kinds of businesses that just won't work. And I know we're in the business of exceptions and that is 100% true, but that doesn't mean that everything is correct to be tried. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And so does this go back to what we said about kind of investing in the J-curve where you have to have that, otherwise it's fundamentally impossible to scale or is there an alternate meaning? I, it dovetails with that. I think a lot about, you know, so, so going back to like, let's like the, the kind of Hippocratic oath, first do no harm. Like think about how many founders are misguided to start companies because they look to the current ecosystem of venture funding and use those inputs, use those data points as inputs into companies to start. I get you, I mean. but I also don't know. It's like people who are like, you know, a lot of the stuff that I will put out is directionally right for 90% of people. I don't mean that arrogantly, but it, it just is. And then for 10%, 100%, it does not make sense and you should discard it. And you know what? Let's just be an adult. Let's understand that for 90%, it is right. And for 10%, don't listen to me. Don't hate me. Just be an adult. And when you have something where it doesn't align to some venture advice that you hear, don't hate on it. Just be an adult. Or you know what great, you know, Daniel Eck at Spotify, an incredible founder of our generation, would have been told on all social platforms, on all like, discussion platforms, this doesn't work. The record labels will never do it. But the great founders plow on and persist and do it. I think we're, you're almost kind of, putting like blame on people for being not blame that's unfair but like you know like uh, found, great founders don't listen great founders don't listen and also our survivor bias of entrepreneurship isolates and rewards and you know creates narrative storytelling around people that like didn't listen but what i, I guess what i'm saying is there are structure in many in, in many cases there are, are are very strong structural reasons why companies could exist when they existed for example let's take mobile let's take mobile social networks right or mobile user like user generated content networks yeah. there's a very clear reason why the order of founding went from Twitter first to Instagram to Snapchat to TikTok. And it is because mobile as infrastructure and bandwidth in its earliest stages supported the lowest packet size Fair. text. And then next, compressed images, Instagram. And then images and short form video and then video and audio. There's a very clear reason why it had to happen that way. And so like TikTok couldn't have been started before Twitter. And so like, I think venture understandably heavily incentivizes everyone to try everything all the time. And it's good for venture, but I am increasingly interested in trying to apply greater frameworks of approach and theory onto business evaluation, because I do think that if we can increase the efficacy with which we guide entrepreneurship writ large, just think about the returns that could happen. If we reduce the heat loss of entrepreneurship, even though Venture capital as a business is structurally advantaged for like maximum shots on goal, regardless of heat loss. If we could reduce the heat loss of entrepreneurship, I'd be amazed. Do you know the, the venture capital product is just pretty broken? And I know we're going broad now, but like, you know, the alignment with LPs is largely not there. You see that with a lot of the uh, fundraisers that we've seen over the last few years. You know, bluntly, the fee to carry model makes it incredibly profitable as a business to the point where you can make nba player salaries as a gp with large funds there is this huge misalignment there there's a huge misalignment in lps who don't get carry in any of their vehicles 
who are optimizing for not getting fired. The, structurally, the industry is fraught with breakages in my mind. Yes, I agree. It's one of those situations where, like, show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. Exactly. How I couldn't agree change, more. How do we check? What do you think? It has about? to be regulation, right? It has to be regulation. Regulation is probably the only answer. Sure. Um, for one, I think it's kind of crazy that whether it's like venture, hedge funds, or private equity, that there are people who can commingle their labor value with capital value. Right or like the carried what do you, interest. What, what do you, sorry, what do you mean by commingle labor value with capital value? People that deploy capital as their job are compensated for their labor value in deploying that capital as capital. And NBA players, right? NBA players are they create value. It is their like labor value. They are taxed at income tax levels. They don't get to enjoy capital gains taxes in the value that they're creating. What's crazy is that deploying capital as their job, if they're successful, a top, like the vast majority of their returns are taxed as capital gains, not labor. I'm not liking that's why crazy. This, I'm not liking why this is <laughs> this is not a lot, but that's delete. crazy. That's so broke. That's so broken. That's like, and I think. So if I were to think about the system design, the system design of society, wow. if you were to look at the current state of the financial world, venture capital, private equity, hedge funds, as a brain drain that is this massive sucking noise on smart, ambitious people because they've realized that, oh, this is a dominant strategy in this version of capitalism and in this regulatory environment. You probably should tax carried interest like income tax. That would write, that would like break that structurally different incentive mechanism. And then it would diffuse talent elsewhere. Would it? Do you think, do you, I, I'm, I'm genuinely intrigued. Would it? Because I, I think like, you know, the vast salaries, the quite glacial life of most venture investors. Now, not not all. Some work incredibly hard. I want. I hate the depiction that. But like you know, compared to traditional finance jobs, where it it is grinding, venture is fun with innovative entrepreneurs. I don't know if it would. Do you know what I mean? So I would say like that's one of a number of regulatory changes that would probably have to happen in order to right. change it. Um, I'm not making the claim that venture isn't fun and that venture wouldn't attract great people. Because it, like, at the end of the day, it is like an enjoyable way to spend your time, particularly if you're curious and like. But I do think it would cool what is an overheated attraction to the industry. I I agree with that, and I I, I get that. Um, yeah, I think there've been a lot of tourists coming over the last few years for sure. Chris, can I ask, how are your fundraisers? I mean this with total respect, but like, you know, you're a young girl manager and yes, you spun out of Thrive, which is blue chip or blue chip, but like, how was LP response to you? Um, I feel very fortunate um, in the LP response. I think... I don't know if this is something that you experienced as well, but for better, for worse, when you go out to raise money as uh, an emerging manager, there's there's nothing you can do to change like things up. Like you can't change what people say behind say about closed say be say about you behind closed doors. There's nothing you can do to change that. There's nothing you can do to change your track record. There's nothing you can do. So when an LP does reference calls and they dig in and they do diligence. There's nothing you can do to change the data that they're going to harvest mm -hmm. and come back to market, like come back with. And so in many ways, like that's all it is. No, because you can change the perception of that data, which is just as important as the data. And so I will say when I know that data is going to come back, maybe not great, you know, I, I will caveat and say, hey, if you were to do references on me, 
you would probably hear as a weakness that Harry is incredibly short on time. He runs two businesses at the same time, and it means time is just more precious with him than others. That's a con. Um, I'll caveat it so they're not surprised, they're expecting it, they know that I'm self-aware, and I'm probably looking at ways of solving it. The solving for their expected outcome of that data, for me, is as important as solving the data itself. So, yes, and what is the goal? Is the goal to hit a is the goal to hit a number or is the goal to find aligned investors? Both. Because okay. if the goal is to find aligned investors, you you actually want your investors to have as high fidelity of data as possible and then and then regardless of their interpretation of it, say yes or no. I get you. I get you, but if I think the goal you... is to hit a number then the perception interpretation of that information matters. But I think perception is still like, even if you have aligned investors where you think they are aligned and they are aligned to you, but as you said, you can't control the data that they get in. And so like, if they are aligned and they are truly aligned, getting ahead of it, showing that you're self-aware is not like some strategic manipulation of data and perception. It's just a, hey, Chris, I want to caveat ahead of time. All right, this is this might come back, and I don't want you to be put off by it adversely. But what, like, wouldn't you strictly prefer an investor that saw that as a feature, not a bug? Yes, but some some just like don't on initial reaction, and then they go to their partnerships and they say, "Oh, we got this back," and their partnerships who don't know you as well and don't have granular data go, "Oh, that's bad." Well, I'm not sure about that. And then the data manipulation and contortion happens inside partnerships. Internal discussion happens. And what was a very pure data point, which is, oh, Harry's quite busy, or, oh, Chris is quite busy, turns into, oh, well, actually, you know, there, there's you know, not enough for bandwidth, and there's real partnership. All of these things because of their partnership discussions. I think going back to, like, showing the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. So when we were fundraising, and I think, honestly, in life, I think this is true, we had kind of a mantra, which is optimize for alignment, not outcomes. I think in many situations, people, companies can optimize for outcomes rather than alignment. And that over-rotation ultimately over time leads to misalignment. So how did you then deliberately, I'm fascinated here, love that. How did you then deliberately optimize for alignment over outcomes? We were, we were as transparent as possible with every single investor that we spoke with and we in our fund one fundraising presentation, we had a slide that says, this is what we think fund one will look like. This is what we think funds five and beyond will look like. Huh. And so you as an investor are, yes, assessing what we are trying to do in this moment in time, but we are also very intentional and we're, we're trying to give you as much forward information as possible about where it is that we want to go, what we want to build. And we want to make sure that you're also aligned with this future of the firm. Because the relationships that we're establishing are not one to two year relationships. You know, our goal is for future GPs of PACE to have as good of relationships with the investment professionals at our LPs as we do decades in the future. And so if that is the goal, you have to be able to find institutions that are aligned with the future strategy of the firm. Chris, how many LPs do you have? We have about 12 institutional LPs in Fund 1 and 15 in Fund 2. How many meetings did you take for Fund 1? Probably 50, something like that. What was the most common reason they said no? Um. So interestingly enough, I think the, and it's totally understandable, LPs have really hard jobs, right? When we invest, we at least get to invest in assets. We're like, okay, well, I think this is a good business. And regardless of the management team, I think it's a good business. LPs have to, have to invest behind judgment, right? So they're trying to extrapolate out. They're trying to fit a curve to a single data point if it's the first time that they're meeting you. And that is an impossible task to ask somebody to do. Like, how do you extrapolate a curve from a single data point? That's impossible. Most of our LPs 
for fund one were people that we had longitudinal relationships with uh -huh. that were able to fit that curve over a much longer set of data. And so there, you know, it, it wasn't, um, actually, I don't think, I don't know if we got to a yes for any of our LPs in fund one, where we met them in the process. I would say like Mark, Mark Suster has a brilliant uh, article, invest in lines, not dots. And I meet two new LPs every week and I ask them for recommendations each time. And I'm not fundraising, but it means that now, you know, I've met them over years also with my deployment pace. So yep. <laughs> and and the, the LPs that joined in fund two, we developed relationships with over the deployment of fund one. Chris, did you do a first close, second close? How do you feel about the closing mechanisms? Um, we did, uh, we did a single close for both funds. Um, I recognize that there's some like ego signaling involved in that. Um, at the end of the day, I think the only thing that matters is the thing that helps you do what, do what you want to do. And there are many ways to skin a cat and like. It, that's entering the world of micro optimizations. I, I totally get you. What's the biggest misalignment between LP and GP two stage? You think? Oh my gosh, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> probably a handful of things. One is it's not clear to me that management fees were really intended to stack over multiple closed end funds at increasingly high denominations. Right. If you look at, even if you look at like hedge funds, right? Sure, management fees on top of a large AUM, but there are redemption mechanisms. It is there. there it there isn't this like structural cantilevering process of capital, the way that there are with closed end funds. So there's that. I would say, excruciatingly long feedback loops. Right. There's the adage of like venture capital firms take forever to die because they're just so long in the tooth. What, what, what would you say is the, like, how could you change that? Because that's just company maturation uh, timelines uh, in a lot of cases. How could you solve that? Yeah. So let's imagine a world, right? Hypothetically, where there was carry clawback across funds and, but, and management fees were all to the dollar rationally budgeted, what would the venture world look like then? Empty. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, like, let's say like the, let's say alignments were actually like, let's say incent incentives were actually, actually aligned. So like, if you lost money in another fund that could be clawed back against carry from prior funds. I've never heard of that, um, cross fund carry clawback. Right. That, I mean, like, like for better, or for worse, like. That's just the current state of supply and demand in the LPGP ecosystem doesn't support that. That like doesn't clear the bid. It's a it's a mechanism that theoretically could exist with enough dislocation between supply and demand, but it doesn't currently. What other misalignments? You said many. I so, find I find I find another which is like, you know, if you think about your core funds as a pool of optionality, which I, I've seen this happen many times. So manager thinks of core fund as an optionality set. Put in 30 checks, no reserves, no double downs, and then I'll leverage the core funds, the initial funds, to then raise SPVs on anything that pops with individual separate LPs, or maybe one or two from the existing funds. But that's where my real alpha is made on the core optionality pool that is the fund itself. That to me is a gross misalignment. So as long as all the LPs are aware of the strategy, upon signing up for the initial fund, the core fund, and all LPs have an equal opportunity to participate in every totally SPV exactly. sure. and have equal information, then that doesn't violate kind of the alignment incentives in my mind. Um, if there is asymmetry along any one, any number of one of those, then I would say like, yeah, that that's messed up. Yeah. No, I totally agree. What, what else? I love that cross carry clawback. What happens to what happens to the multi billion dollar funds that raise massive, massive funds in the last few years and are sitting on twenty five years of history 
bloated teams, bloated partnerships. I don't think all of, I almost like definitionally, I don't think all of them make it. I think we're going to see over the next, here's the thing, like it's going to take a long time. It's going to take a decade plus for this stuff to unwind, but they're going to get lost to the sands of time. If you could change one thing about the world of LPs, what would you change? Like, I think GP commits are just inherently wrong in a lot of ways because they prohibit a huge amount of diverse but brilliant people. They're not proportional to wealth. Uh, and there's arbitrary numbers placed on 2%, 3%, 4%. But ridiculous. I agree with that, whilst also simultaneously agreeing with the intention behind, the intention to align incentives. Totally get that. Agreed. But it should be proportional to wealth. There should be flexibility of mindset around it. And it should be viewed in a different kind of uh, paradigm. Okay, let's do let's do a fi final one and then a quick fire. Is there anything more broken on the GP ecosystem that you think is important to highlight, or any misalignments between founders and investors? I think this is a really important one for founders also to hear. Is like where are founders and investors misaligned? An example would be liquidity. Um, sometimes it is in the in interest of the investor to sell when it may not be in the interest of the founder for them to sell at that time. One of the biggest areas of misalignment between founders and investors is probably management incentive in an acquisition. So management incentive in an acquisition is basically when the acquiring company says, you, the management team, will have this compensation package here when you join. None of that is going to is going economically to your cap table. And so as an acquirer, you can be like, hey, company X, Y, and Z, we actually want to give you a massive management incentive to join for us to acquire a company. And like, let's say in this hypothetical situation, we're going to give $0 to your cap table. That's a huge misalignment of incentives between founders and investors, where the founders are like, awesome, this is going to be great for me. And then investors are like, I'm stuck holding the bag because we helped build this business or get it here. And then there's like, no. So I think there, there are significant, there are, there are opportunities. There are always opportunities for misalignment. That is a very large example. To your point, like driving the prioritization of liquidity, particularly from an investor perspective, is another area of misalignment. There's, there's a misalignment on round construction too, which really pisses me off which is, I will say, hey, um, I'm going to help you construct your round. And I really, as the lead, uh, enforce my views and opinions on having X and Y. And I'm doing X and Y, bringing them in, because they brought me into the last rounds. And they've been helpful to me. It may not be optimal for the company itself to have them over someone else. You may be much better aligned, but this person brought me my last deal and I owe them favors. You know, it's that kind of transactional nature of venture where someone gives you a deal, you kind of feel like you need to give them one back. And it, that is another misalignment. Yeah, um, that makes sense. I think that feels to me like it falls into the bucket of things that are short-term costs and long-term good. One could make the argument that without that behavior, the investors that are leading wouldn't be in the position to lead. And so it's like, the, it's like this, that's like still the dominant strategy to achieve the full maximum outcome, but it is like the cost of doing business in the short run, assuming that there is carryover reputation across iterations of the game. I think the mac the areas of maximum misalignment are when it feels like the reputation does not carry over in between iterations of the game, or that's the final iteration of the game that any one participant is playing. Sure. Yeah. Because then people are incentivized to maximize the short term rather than long term. Chris, I could talk to you all day. I am aware that uh, we've taken 20 VC to a slight extreme. I want to do a quick fire round. So I say a yep. short statement and then you give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Yep. Yep. So what's your biggest investing hit and what did you learn from it? So huh. I'm, I would say like probably the company that I was able to be involved with that is the most publicly well-known is probably Twitch. So my career has just been downhill since then. Um, I learned a lot about what it takes to be a good board member. I learned a lot about how to navigate 
hyper competitive environments. What did you specifically in those cases, if you were to distill one or two things like the importance of staying calm on a board, the importance of like product marketing differentiation, if you kind of drill down and extract that, what is that? I think a board, a great board is meant to be like a mirror to the founders and the operating team. Um, very rarely, I think, does a, is a board supposed to offer prescriptive advice? Um, in the same way that if you were to ask advice from, you know, somebody you really trust, oftentimes they would just ask questions to help you develop confidence that you are making the right decision. And so in many ways, I think that a great board is meant to reflect as clear thinking back to the operators, the CEO, the leadership team. Not necessarily introduce net new information or be prescriptive. Um, I would say if I'm doing my job well, I'm half therapist, half coach. On um, navigating competitive environments, I think seeing Twitch firsthand gave me one of my mental frameworks, which is are like companies or platforms that start with the explicit strategy of poaching, like economically incentivizing supply from another platform. So like you, we see this, you, you see this in like companies starting and they're offering kind of creators or the supply, like minimum guarantees, economically incentivizing them. Um, that strategy does not work because you are fighting an uphill battle and going against gravity. And so we at Twitch, we saw countless competitors, inclusive of Mixer, Microsoft's in, like competitor, throw massive minimum guarantees at streamers on Twitch, and none of them, they all failed. What's the future of Substack? Substack is an interesting company where I don't know if they have business model product fit. I think it's pretty clear that they have product market fit, but it's not clear to me that they have business model product fit. Any other piece of software that looks like Substack, you would assume charges a flat, but you would assume does not charge a percent of revenue, particularly at the scale that Substack does. So like, for example, let's take Shopify. Could Shopify as a business justify charging 10% of GMV? No. Then why can Substack? Um, I think Substack can because of the intangible value on cost of time to create versus the tangible value of cost of goods to sell. If it costs me $10 to make this bracelet, I can actually put a cogs on that versus the three hours it took me to write that piece of information that I don't price efficiently, is mispriced, is unknown price. I think that can work at small scale, right? At small scale, that can work. But at large scale, it inevitably begs the question, is this worth what I'm paying? And I would expect that business model to have a leaky bucket at the top or at best get margin compressed at the top. So you have the best, like the people that have the most distribution that are the best for the platform from a marketing perspective, dramatically negotiating down their economics. So for, you know, if you look at like card processing, Stripe, Adyen, the biggest customers don't pay the rate card. They negotiate down from the 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 rate card of whatever three percent and thirty cents to an interchange plus, yeah. and so you get margin compressed. I agree. Uh, tell me, my friend, what's the biggest investing miss uh, or mistake, and what did you learn? I think one of the things that I have learned about myself <laughs> as an investor and it's pretty idiosyncratic is I make the best decisions without like leverage or help. 
So as an investor, I don't work with an associate. Like I don't, I, I don't have an associate. I don't have a principal. I don't have an analyst. Um, and I think it's because in the past I have made, I've been in a position where I didn't do the customer calls. I didn't do, I didn't myself do all of the diligence and it was synthesized into information that was digestible and presentable to make an investment decision, but I hadn't done the work myself. And through that, I've learned that I can make, I, I should not be in those positions. I should force myself to do the work myself. And if I don't want to do the work, that is a really strong input into my inherent level of conviction. I think you're so right. I think it's also so important to be the one taking the references, to be digging in deeper, to be hearing that tone change, which says enough, but doesn't say everything. And to really be feeling that full experience, I think it's really important. So I think that's interesting. Okay, hit me, my friend, other than Thrive, because that's obviously family for you, which multi-stage fund would you invest in? This may just be because in my investing career, I had like the most overlap with the firm. And maybe it's because they funded us meeting at the first time. But maybe Index. Huh. Yeah. I... Um, that's like to avoid the kind of boilerplate answer of Sequoia. I, I I appreciate that intensely. I've asked six people and they all gave me Sequoia. So, you know, you, you are the first not to. And so I appreciate that. If you could choose one board member to be on your board as a founder, who would it be? I know they bring different things, but you can only have one and they are amazing that you've worked with. Who is it? I had the opportunity to, to sit on a board with a guy named Craig Sherman, who works at a firm called Meritech. And yeah. I really enjoyed working with them. I'm not sure if your question disqualified investors, but uh... no, that's perfect. I love that. Um, I, I want to finish on, on one final one. You mentioned the the five fund vision for Pace. What does Pace? Look, what do, what does Pace look like then in thirty years' time, Chris? Um, hopefully, Pace is five or six perfectly equal partners. I am no longer there. Um, it's continues to focus on like the platonic ideal venture capital series a is involved with some of the most forward companies of its generation. Chris, my friend, I've absolutely loved this. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for going off schedule, uh, so much, uh, but you've been a Likewise. star and this has been such a good discussion.